Hello everybody and welcome to chapters 9 and 10. Alright, so autonomous um, access points. An autonomous access point obviously works individually. It, it's autonomous of control, so it, it's, it's centrally controlled itself. So each one has to be configured manually, which means if you're going to set up 12 access points, you have to s configure to all 12 access points individually, which is kind of a pain in the butt. Now, they're typically used in small to medium-sized businesses, and actually the majority of the wireless installations you're going to see are autonomous access points. And this is one topic that I, I kind of disagree with Cisco on. The CCNA wireless exam covers autonomous access points and enterprise-level lightweight access points. The majority of people, IT techs and stuff, are never going to see a lightweight access point in a controller in use um, because they're going to work for you know small and medium-sized companies. So, in my opinion, they should have two exams, maybe like a CCNA wireless that only covers autonomous access points, and maybe a CCNP wireless uh, that covers uh, lightweight access points and the controllers. But I digress. So, moving on, um, this is what the, the autonomous controllers look like. Obviously, there's, there's some kind of power connection typically. There's a place for a console port on the Cisco ones, uh, and then there's a place for an Ethernet, then this top slides over. and all of these always have a reset button. Any access point I've ever seen has a reset button. And that way if you, uh, if the, like to say the network administrator moves on or has a heart attack or something, um, you can just reset those and, and configure them with new passwords and stuff. And then over here on the right you have Aruba. Now Aruba is really kind of hammering Cisco and some other companies because um, their wireless stuff is so easy to use. There's not a whole lot of programming. Everything's uh, a, a GUI interface. Uh, even the college has switched over to Aruba wireless access points. Um, it, and a lot of their stuff is just so neat, but it's way cheaper. But with that price, you also kind of get some cheaper construction. Like a lot of these Arubas, uh, this outside piece is all plastic, where on the Cisco stuff, this is all metal. So you got to, I guess, it depends on what kind of environment you're going to be. Um, but Aruba, most of the time when you're in the real world and you're actually in the small and medium-sized businesses, wireless installations, you're going to see a lot of Aruba. All right, so a bridge. Access points are basically just translation bridges. All they do is they take the signal coming in from the Ethernet port, the electronic signal that's, you know, pulse of electricity, and it converts those into radio waves. So it takes signals that come in one form and changes them to another and obviously boosts them um, so you can project out another 100 feet or so. All right, you remember that each um, SSID um, is the, just the name of the network. Well, if you've got multiple networks, you have to separate those with VLANs. So like your access point would then connect to a switch, uh, and that, that connection may be a trunk. So let's say you're at a, a small medical facility and you want to give wireless to your patients. Um, you may have a public wireless and then a private wireless for the physicians. So they can run around with their laptops and you want to keep those two separate. So VLANs are how we do it on the other side. So with wireless, we separate things with SSID. Uh, and then we encrypt the stuff that needs to be encrypted, you know, with WPA, WPA2. But with, um, on our wired network, we can't do that. So we kind of translate the SSIDs to different VLANs. So if you have multiple VLANs, you're going to require a trunk between the access point and the switch to allow those multiple VLANs in there. And that's why this week for our lab, we're doing a bunch of VLAN stuff. But moving on. So APs. You know, by default, an access point will try and obtain an IP address through DHCP. So you plug it into the network and all of a sudden it says, hey, I need an IP address. If that fails, so it sends out its discovery, um, its DHCP recovery or discovery offer, and nothing comes back. So if that fails, it'll try and assign itself an IP address of 10.001/26. Now again, this is only for Cisco. So if it does that or whatever, for some reason, or you want to assign it for something specifically, um, you'll need to console in and assign an IP address to the bridge virtual interface. So because the access point really is just a bridge that translates one signal to another, the interface that you're going to work with is called the bridge virtual interface. Just like on a router, you deal with a fast Ethernet port or a, a WAN port. On a switch, you deal with a BVI, a bridge virtual interface. So here's what it looks like. And don't ask me where I found this. It was just on the Internet. So obviously you go to Enable, then you go to Config T, and then Interface BVI 1. Uh, and for some reason, uh, you don't do BVI 0, which is really odd. Um, 
Uh, and also, like on the back of the controller, they're numbered like one through eight, which is not zero through seven, like you would on a firewall. So again, the, that kind of thing is odd. And I don't know where that came from. If it was a separate company that did that and had no idea that Cisco numbers everything with zero, I have no idea. And then again, you just sign a sign an IP address. So IP space address, blah 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 blah. Space the subnet mask. So pretty self-explanatory. So once you do that, then you can um, dial in, um, access the the GUI. Uh, and then do whatever you need to do. All right, so radios. An access point can have multiple radios and use multiple frequencies. Um, when we get into the, the 1200 series access points, you're gonna see that you can actually plug in two different radios. Um, and those radios can be, you know, uh, I can put in a, a 2.4 and a five gig radio in there. So the radios, are, uh, especially on the autonomous access points, are turned off by default on Cisco. Um, way back in a long time ago, we bought some Cisco access points, couldn't figure out why they wouldn't work, and then <laughs> realized that, hey, we'd never turn on the radios. So all interfaces are turned off on all Cisco devices by default, except for a switch. The switch is the only thing you can pull out of the box, plug it in, and everything works. <laughs> everything else has to be turned on. All right, and then as you're going through the GUI, you may notice um, a category that says Cisco Aeronet Extensions. Those are Cisco proprietary wireless extensions. You need to have basically be using a, a Cisco uh, wireless card in your laptop um, in order to use those. So a lot of times you're going to turn those off. Now with lightweight access points, they get their software from the controller, and that's why they're called lightweight access points because um, they're they're kind of like dumb access points that just wait for somebody to tell it what to do. So it's lightweight because it doesn't have all the extra software. It just pulls that stuff from the controller. So if for some reason you need to upgrade the iOS um, on your controller, or if you're doing an autonomous access point you know, on it, uh, the first thing you need to do is download the new iOS image to your desktop, then access the GUI, and then click on the software tab, and then click on software upgrade. Uh, and this is typically like a question on the CCNA wireless. So basically, um, you go into the, the GUI. So here's the, the 1240. Um, I click on software or system software and then software upgrade and then the TFTP because I'm going to obviously I'm going to do it through uh, cable and then click on upgrade and then you point it to where it's going to go and you're all set. So and you can also turn autonomous access points into lightweight access points and vice versa. Cisco makes the software images for both of those. So let's say you have a bunch of 1131 access points up in your ceiling that are all autonomous and then you decide hey I'm going to buy a wireless LAN controller and then and control these. Um, you can download new images for your access points and turn an autonomous into a lightweight access point. Uh, but that's kind of a pain in the butt. All right, so lightweight access points. Lightweight access points means the configuration can be done on a controller and pushed out to the access point remotely. So we don't do a lot of stuff on the access point itself. As a matter of fact, we just kind of plug it in um, and let the controller do all the work. So some lightweight access points don't even have a console port. All they have is power and an Ethernet. So you basically you plug them into your network and they ask for stuff and they, they pull all the information from the controller. Cisco's Meraki line of access points um, do not have a console port, which is kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. You know, it, it all depends. You guys are just learning this stuff, so you'll develop your own methods of doing things. But I've always, like, anytime I got a Cisco device, I always pulled it out of the box, put it on my desk, slapped a console cable in there, and did the configuration, or at least get the IP address on the device. So um, dealing with the Meraki, I've never had to deal with those because by that time I was a professor and never had to mess with those. Um, it would just seem odd. But anyway, and we already talked about APs can be converted to lightweight. So again, Meraki, um, that's a Cisco line. Uh, they don't have a console port. So they'll use a local address if DHCP is not given. So if, if they don't get an IP address from DHCP, it uses the 10.0.0.1 slash 26 address. Now, what I hear on the street from my friends that are still actually doing the real world stuff uh, is that if you have an entire Meraki system, like you have Mara the access controller Cisco, the wireless access points of Meraki, blah, 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 that it's, it's a beautiful system, everything works awesome, um, and it's great. But if you try to mix it with other pieces of like Aruba or something else, it's a nightmare. So that's what I hear. All right, so chapter 10, cloud controlled APs. Lou. All right, and that's just when we use a wireless LAN controller to centrally control the wireless access points. So imagine you're working for a national company and you're at their headquarters office, and it's a big building, eight floors, something like that, and it's really large, uh, and they have, let's say, 25 access points. 
Well, you don't want to be configuring those all individually. And anytime one breaks, you don't want to go running over to it and, and have to like re, uh, do stuff. But anyway, so having a wireless LAN controller allows you to do everything at the controller and kind of push it out. So that when you need to do an update, you don't have to go and grab 25 different wireless access points out of the ceiling and take them to your desk or try to remote into all 25 access points and do that stuff manually because that's a pain. Um, and trust me, you're going to have better things to do. So the wireless LAN controller is kind of nice because you can control the access points from a central location, push out what you need to do, do updates, that kind of stuff. All right, and what a wireless LAN controller does, so here's the controller. It builds um, tunnels between the wireless LAN controller and the APs, and then it sends everything that way through these kind of encrypted tunnels. And your access points form a relationship with the wireless LAN controller. So depending if you're using more than one, like our wireless LAN controllers at Stark, um, only allow for 10 access points to be used. So if once you have nine access points, you gotta go buy a second controller. So the way it works, you know, your AP comes online, he's like, oh, I need to talk to a controller because I don't have an IP address. And again, these are lightweight access controller point or lightweight access points. So they don't have any information. So they um, they they send a message out, say, hey, where's the wireless LAN controller? The controller responds, um, they form a relationship, and then they build this tunnel, the CapWap tunnel. Uh, and then that's what's used to send the authentication information and whatnot. So when my PC then remote or wires, wirelessly, wirelessly contacts the lightweight access point, he sends stuff to the controller, the controller then goes somewhere else and, and it authenticates me. Uh, and that way all that stuff is kind of like up and down these tunnels. So when you hear CapWap tunnels, that's what we're talking about. All right, so here's what a wireless LAN controller looks like. It is the exact same thing as a 5505 uh, firewall. And the only way you can tell the difference from the front is by looking at the name down here. And that's it, because it's the exact same case and stuff. The only difference it really is the name here on the front, and in the back, they're actually numbered, uh, the ports, 1 through 8, and not uh, 0 through 7 like they are on, on a firewall. So I've always wondered if maybe they had these manufactured somewhere else, and they sent them these cases, uh, and somewhere else to like, use normal thinking, and, they, and decided to number everything 1 through 8. This is the only thing from Cisco I've ever seen like that. But I digress. So the wireless LAN controller, the 2106 that we're gonna deal with, um, has several interfaces. And these interfaces can be virtual, uh, actually they're all um, virtual or they're all logical, let's put it that way. They're not physical. They can all, all of these ports or these, these logical interfaces can all be connected via one single physical port. So the management interface um, handles radius. So when an access point says, hey, I need to log this person in, here's the username and password they gave me, it would go to the controller, then the controller would use the management interface to talk to the radius server to authenticate that person. Um, the management interface is also used for wireless LAN controller to wireless LAN controller communication. So if I have two controllers and somebody roams between them, um, and which we'll talk about next week, um, all that is done through the management interface. If I want to SSH or do a web session into the, uh, the wireless LAN controller, all of that is handled through the management interface. Now, the AP manager is a second logical interface, and that handles the controller to the access point communication. So all communication between the wireless LAN controller and the access point is handled via the AP manager. And then the virtual interface um, really deals with like DHCP relay, kind of client side stuff that, that um, the, the management or the AP interface don't have to deal with. All right, and then when you're dealing with the wireless LAN controllers, you may see um, some options called lag. And lag is just short for link aggregation. So basically, if you have lag on a wireless LAN controller, then ether channel must be configured on a switch. So basically what I'm saying is, I want to, let's say I want to take ports one, two, three, and four and link them all to the switch and let them all work as one. So that's where, that's where lag comes in. So I do ether channel on the switch and I set up lag on the wireless LAN controller. So by default, distribution ports are bundled together as a lag link, and you should see something like this. Um, yeah, in the controller. Um, lag mode is currently enabled or disabled or something like that. So in our class, we, disable, we, we just disable lag, but if you ever see the thing lag mode or whatever and you wonder what that is, that's what that is. All right, and then other than that, um, this week in the lab, you're gonna configure the wireless LAN controller um, either through the GUI or the CLI. So basically, uh, at first, you have to plug it in, you have to console in, you have to at least uh, uh, attempt to connect to it through the CLI so that you can put the IP address on there. Once you have the IP address on, then you can access the GUI. But other than the IP address, everything can be done through the GUI, and it's much, much simpler. 
Um, but you can, if you want to, skip the GUI and configure the entire thing from the CLI. I don't recommend that. Um, as far as the access points go in wireless, everybody else's wireless is, has a GUI, so you might as well just use Cisco's GUI. All right, and again, we'll be doing that in the lab this week, so if you have any questions, let me know. Other than that, um, have a great week. Bye-bye.